And welcome everyone. This is Fierce Females in Art. Um, this is hosted by the Granby Public Library and sponsored by the Friends of Granby Public Library. It's that time of year when we are definitely looking to renew memberships with the Friends. They are one of the principal supporters and funders of our programming. So if you have any um, uh, idea about supporting the friends you can do that monetarily or you can do it with your time too so um, do take a look for their campaign mailer that went out in the monthly granby drummer our local paper and uh, you can also find out more information about the friends and the library on the library's website which is granby-ct.gov slash library so um, easy to find. E you can also just Google Granby Public Library and then make sure you have the one in Connecticut, not Granby Mass and not Granby Colorado because those two do pop up. Um, again, thank you all for being here today. This is an excellent um, program that we have uh, with a repeat presenter. We have our back by popular demand. Um, we're going to talk about fierce females in art today. And that's because women have long been the subject of art, but often depicted as nothing more than objects of desire. So how do those images of women change when women actually become the creators? And that's what we're going to learn more about today. Uh, Jane O'Neill, an art educator and curator, um, is with us today, and she's going to explore the lives, careers, and works of several major women artists from the Renaissance to the 20th century. Um, these will include Artemisia Gentileschi and Mary Cassatt, um, among others. And just a few more words about our presenter today. Jane O'Neill curates and delivers art appreciation programs to audiences throughout New England and probably beyond now because Zoom is a wonderful platform. Um, she holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. A New, Har uh, New Hampshire native, Jane has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire's Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier, uh, Courier, Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, and most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. And for more information about Jane, you can go to her website, which is imculturallycurious.com. And so without um, any further ado, I want to give a warm welcome to Jane O'Neill. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Holly, and thank you everybody for joining us. I am delighted that you are interested in learning more about female artists, and I'm honored to be the person to share some of this content with you today. So we have a lot to cover in a, a, a short hour. I think it will fly by because there is so much to, to cover. But before we leave this slide right here, I just wanted to mention something about Rosie the Riveter because she is such an icon and so recognizable. And I think so many of us associate her with this tough, being tough, being beautiful. But, um, but there's sort of a, a, a not so glamorous backstory to Rosie in that this, was, this is an image created by a male artist and it was created in 1943 in order to draw women into the workforce to support the war effort. And so of course, uh, uh, an image like this probably did a great job in doing just that. Who doesn't want to be beautiful? Who doesn't want to be strong? But it was luring them away from homes where they would then go on to make less than men doing the same job and still be expected to uh, run households. So this is an image that uh, probably negatively impacted a lot of women's lives, but I think today uh, women have sort of reappropriated it for our own purposes. And I always want to be Rosie the Riveter for Halloween. It's a great costume. So let's move on and, um, and get started with our topic today on female artists. And I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of, um, of a preamble in terms of our subject matter today. So I have these two images up on the screen just to give you a very general sense in terms of the differences in the way that men and women have been depicted in the history of art. These are images from the past 200 years or so. We have Napoleon on horseback, painted by a French artist named Jacques-Louis David. This was right around 1800. And then we have this beautiful woman painted by the artist Edmund Tarbell. It's called Reverie from 1913. And in, in this comparison, you can probably see 
uh, the, the man is depicted as someone of consequence, a, a, per, a person engaged in action. Um, it, it's an animated scene, his hands raised, the wind's blowing, he's on a windswept mountain. Uh, there's a lot to look at here. And, and the figure himself, even if it wasn't Napoleon, feels uh, important. And it feels like someone that, that we should pay attention to. The woman, on the other hand, just looks idle. And, and, and the difference there is that she becomes more of an object than the subject of this painting. She seems beautiful. She seems sort of um, unaware almost that, that she's being painted. So throughout the history of art, you see men who are, um, who are uh, essentially committing these great historical deeds that are being recorded. And then you have women who are, are just being painted because they're essentially nice to look at. So how does this, how does this translate in terms of, of uh, uh, the history of art when women start making art themselves? So before we dive into our subject, I sort of wanted to define what it means to be fierce to get us started. So my working definition here is women who created art that defied expectations and pushed back beyond the boundaries of what was considered appropriate, acceptable, or desirable for their time. And the image on the screen here is by an Italian Baroque artist. She's not very well known because she died at the age of 27. So she didn't have this long expansive career to study. Her name is uh, Elisabetta Serrani. And this was painted in 1659. The scene is actually uh, a historical scene of a woman who is murdering her rapist. So it's, I bring in this image because one, it's a female artist, but it's also a female heroine being depicted. It's pretty unusual to see women um, of, of consequence, women of action in a painting like this. And I just love this, this man's sort of uh, ungainly kind of pinwheeled pose as he's being dumped into this well and this woman's exacting her revenge. So uh, another example of a fierce female that I wanted to share with you is from this film still. This is from a film by a Swiss artist named Pipoletti Riest. And the, the, there's copies of this film in museums all over the world. And it's from 1997. The name of the film is Ever is Over All. And what we see here just in the film still, but in the film itself is this beautiful woman who's walking down a city street in this kind of diaphanous blue dress and bright red shoes. Bright red shoes always get attention. And she is smashing car windows as she walks down the sidewalk. So this is a really sort of anti-authoritarian um, expression of freedom. And it's certainly going against what you would expect a, a beautiful woman wearing such clothes to be doing. So interestingly enough, uh, the pop sensation Beyonce actually quoted this film in one of her recent videos for a, a 2016 song. So I'm sure without the context of, of Reese film, there were a lot of people that probably just thought that Beyonce was walking around smashing windows, but she was really, giving a nod to um, a fierce female that came before her. Beyonce herself has really sort of adopted this moniker of being fierce in, um, in much of the way that she's promoted. She's also associated with another um, F word and that is feminist. And before I make this all about Beyonce, I just wanted to sort of quickly note too, the other ways that she goes back throughout the history of art and, um, and appropriates images of women that we think of as being very strong and defying expectations for their genders. So with that preamble, I wanted to give you a sense of how we'd move through the material today. There is a lot to cover. Uh, I'm going to give you a very, very brief, uh, a very, very quick <laughs> int introduction to the history of women in art. And I'm going to give you as many surprises as I can, um, just to give you a sense in terms of how they've per participated and, um, and the obstacles that they've faced. And then we have a number of, of really important fierce female artists, and we could spend and, you know, weeks covering just one of them. And I only have a few minutes for each of them. So we won't be covering every aspect of who they are, but really what makes them fierce in terms of their paintings. So, um, and then we'll finish up by looking ahead and sort of uh, 
considering the state of the world for female artists today. Before I move on, I just have to note uh, this beautiful painting that is on the screen here that I included because it's a female artist and a female subject. And I can't get enough of the way that this dress has been painted here. But I always, always think, did she really paint in clothing that looked like this? This is painted by a, a French artist named La Ville Guillard. It's her self-portrait with her pupils from 1785. And this is a painting that you may have seen before because it's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, all, all of these women just look so incredibly elegant and I love any scene where you see uh, women supporting women too. All right, so let's get started with our brief and, and rapid fire history. We are going all the way back. <laughs> we're, we're back uh, to prehistoric cave paintings. And I bring in these images. These images are, are roughly um, from 30,000 years ago. Uh, many of the, the earliest prehistoric cave paintings are from um, Europe and France in particular. So this is from Chauvy Cave. I particularly love this series of overlapping horse heads. They're just sort of beautifully rendered. And, um, and I should note that, that images like this exist all over the world. And generally speaking, art historians have always interpreted them as images that were painted on walls. Uh, and these images were related to rituals uh, around hunting. This was a way for, I, I've, I've read theories that, that um, prehistoric man would even go in and throw spears at the walls or just hold ceremonies for, um, for successful hunts, that sort of thing. What's really interesting, what, well, one of the details of these cave paintings that I've always loved, this is from the Peche Mural Cave, also in France, is that um, many of, uh, of uh, a number of, of these paintings have been signed. And you can see some spotted horses here uh, with these little tiny legs, but then all around them are these handprints. And um, going way back to my um, introduction to art history in college, I remember my textbook even had a picture of a modern day male artist who was kind of showing us how prehistoric man would have uh, created the, the silhouette of those handprints on the wall. So there's all these sort of, uh, there's all these interesting ways that we've talked about these images and attributed them to, to men. Now, these handprints exist all over the world. This is called the Cave of Hands, and this is in South America. And what's very interesting is that within the past decade or so, National Geographic uh, published a study from an anthropologist who went around the world measuring these hands and determined that about three quarters of them are female hands. So we've been talking about um, prehistoric man, we've been talking about hunting, we've been talking about ritual, and um, when it is most likely that, all, that, that the majority of these images were probably created by women. So I think that probably changes our narrative about how these images, how and why these images were, were painted on cave walls. So we're gonna fast forward really quickly all the way up to ancient Greece. And I'm showing you two ancient, uh, ancient Greek vases here that have been painted in the red figure style. And I chose these two vases in particular because I would, I, I would consider the subject of these paintings to be very typical ancient Greek vase painting subjects. So on the left here, we have a battle scene unfolding. You can see a warrior who looks like he's maybe even wearing an animal skin over his head. He's raised a club. It almost looks like he's got a bow and an arrow in the other hand. There's a fallen soldier uh, beneath him who's got a sword and a shield. And you can imagine turning this vase around and having that story unfold in front of you. The other image that I have here is actually um, looking down into a vase and seeing sort of a secret image that would emerge once the vase is, is empty. And what we're looking at here is a romantic scene between a teacher and a student. And this is a homoerotic scene. So a number of, of um, vase paintings featured homoerotic subject matter or subjects of war and violence. So for that, for that reason alone, most art historians assume that the, the painters of these vases were most likely men. And we have one example 
of a really prominent woman who's contributed to ancient Greek vase painting. And the way we know about her is through this incredible mosaic that was discovered in Pompeii. It's about 17 feet wide. And it's this epic battle scene unfolding here between Alexander the Great and Darius the Third. There's this chaos of horses and spears. Let me just zoom in here so that you can see the mosaic work, this little tiny tile, be tile beads that have been um, carefully assembled according to their colors so that we see light and shadow and the intensity of Alexander's eyes here. Now I'm showing you this because this entire image was inspired by an ancient Greek vase, the painting on an ancient Greek vase. And all that we know about the artist was that her name was Helen of Egypt. So she inspired one of the greatest works of the ancient world. And it's interesting to think um, what else she could have done in her career and how many other women were also painting vases at the same time. So we're also going to move up ahead really quickly. And now we are in uh, the Middle Ages and we are looking at two pages from illuminated manuscripts. And these are two great examples of illuminated manuscripts because they show us men in the process of either uh, transcribing a work or, um, or, or creating a, an illustration for, for work. And it gives us a sense that, that these images were often created by monks who you get the sense might've had all the time in the world to create these kind of fantastic abstract designs and um, the imagined architecture all around. And so generally speaking, we think of the great uh, illuminated uh, manuscripts of the Middle Ages as being created solely by male artists. We do have at least one example of a female artist who was working at this time. And this particular image was created uh, um, right around 1290. And the artist here is a nun named Gouda. And the text that she's kind of holding up in her hand translates to Gouda, a sinner wrote and painted this book. Now, this is one of the first women in Western civilization to create a signed self-portrait. Isn't that incredible to think about? And this is just 1290. So Gouda probably wasn't alone in her creation of works like this because anthropologists have recently discovered this jawbone. And, um, and this jawbone is about 900 years old. I believe it was discovered in Germany. And what makes this uh, particularly interesting is that we know that it was uh, the jawbone of a nun. And you can probably see this blue stone that's been lodged in, in her bone um, right alongside her teeth. And this is a little piece of lapis lazuli, a blue stone that would have been imported from about 4,000 miles away that was used to paint um, really sort of rich cobalt blue in, in paintings. And ounce for ounce, it was uh, more expensive than gold at the time. So the fact that it's in her mouth probably indicates that she was an artist and that she would occasionally wet her brush by, um, by, by running her paintbrush through her her, uh, in her mouth, through her mouth, and um, and maybe some of some of the materials that she was painted with, painting with sort of got lodged in her gums. So um, so it's pretty incredible to think that a female artist was using the best materials available at the time in order to paint, and we don't even know who she was. So it, it's interesting. It's interesting to think how many of these stories of successful female artists have been lost to time. Uh, our next uh, our, our next stop along this history is an is an artist who was sort of lost to time, but then rediscovered. Her name is Edmonia Lewis. She's an American artist. She was born in 1840 as a free black woman. She was um, half black and half Native American, and she had this kind of natural ability um, or a natural instinct towards sculpting. And so she received some training. She began to create sculptural busts like the ones that. You, the, like the one that you see here on the right. This is a bust of the abolitionist John Brown. And she was so successful at creating these sculptural busts that um, she sold them, she saved her money, and then she went to Rome to receive the very best training that a sculptor could receive at the time. And when she was 32 years old, she returned to America with this incredible work of art for the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. 
And what we're looking at here is the death of Cleopatra. Cleopatra was a very popular subject at the time. She was beautiful. It was a historical reference. Everybody was interested in, in Cleopatra. And so there were other instances of Cleopatra at this particular exhibition. But Edmonia Lewis's Cleopatra got a lot of attention because this was considered a really sort of ghastly and repellent way to show beautiful Cleopatra. She's in the throes of death here. She's, um, she is sort of awkward, she's exposed, and, and this was considered um, uh, to, to sort of defy expectations of what was appropriate at the time. So, so it got her a lot of attention and it got this sculpture uh, so much attention at this show. But shortly after it was exhibited, this 3000 pound sculpture was lost. And over the years, it was um, in a salvage yard, it marked a horse's grave, it was at a saloon. And then um, ultimately, it was rediscovered, I believe, in the 1980s. And now it's in the collection of the Smithsonian. But it's really incredible to think that a woman could, could exhibit such a successful work of art that garnered so much attention, and that such a significant piece, literally um, so heavy, could just be lost. <laughs> So we're going to fast forward again up to the 20th century and we're looking at a portrait by, um, by a female artist named Alice Neal. I've always loved her portraits. And the portrait subject in this case is really our focus. It's an art historian named Linda Nochlin and this painting dates to 1973. Just a few years earlier, Linda Nochlin had published this seminal essay about uh, that was titled why are there no great women artists? And there's a couple of different threads to her, her argument, one of them being that we generally don't associate genius and artistic genius with women. Think of how easily we can associate the word genius with somebody like Michelangelo or somebody like Picasso. Oh, he's a genius. Michelangelo is a genius. But we rarely associate that term with female artists. When's the last time you referred to Georgia O'Keeffe or Mary Cassatt as being genius? So there's just a disparity there that she was really smart to point out. And the other disparity that she pointed out was the fact that women um, have essentially been barred from artistic training through the centuries. What we're looking at here is this fantastic painting from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It dates to about 1760. And it's painted by an American artist who um, went to London to receive training, the very best training an artist could get in the 1700s. The painting's called The American School. And of course, what's missing here is women. Uh, only men could get this kind of training. This was a boys club even back in the 1700s. If we uh, look at the 1900s, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in, in uh, France, the premier art school um, in the country, if not the, um, the continent, what we see here again is a, a, like another boys club, a, a group of male artists who are painting from a, a live nude model. And the nude model, whether it was male or female, was always sort of a, a sticking issue in terms of women receiving training. Women who had any sort of um, social standing, it was considered really inappropriate for them to be in the same room and studying from a live nude model, which was also considered essential in terms of the training of, of an artist. So we'll wrap up this very quick history with a poster that I love from the Gorilla Girls. And the Gorilla Girls are an anonymous collective of artists and art historians who, um, who put on performances or um, maybe I should say events. And they literally wear uh, gorilla masks and they point out all of these disparities, uh, mostly gender disparities in the art world. So here they put a gorilla mask on a famous nude painting uh, and they say, do women have to be naked to get into the Metropolitan Museum? And then they point out less than 5% of the artists in the modern section are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. 
And I think even pointing out that it's the modern section here. I mean, there's no excuse that women have had access to training in, in the modern era. So, so they're really pointing out um, that there are kind of structural problems and structural barrier, barriers here. So this is all really good to keep in mind as we shift gears now and we look more carefully at a few artists that have managed to bypass all of these obstacles, all of these barriers and have created works of art in spite of them. So the first artist I wanted to introduce you to is Artemisia Gentileschi. She was an Italian Baroque artist. We see her dates here. And, um, and this is her self-portrait as the allegory of painting, which dates to, um, right around 1640. And we see her here uh, painting herself as an allegory, which is a power move because women were, uh, only women were, were ever uh, served as, as allegories in the history of art. So it would be a female figure representing the idea of war or a female figure representing the idea of, um, of abundance or something like that. And then in this case, she's representing the, the very concept of painting, which is what she's so good at. And she does that by, um, by showing herself with these kind of dark, kind of ruffled hair and the necklace and uh, the, the, the mask on the necklace would have been signifiers to her audience at the time that that is who she was. So no living man, male artist would have been able to, to depict themselves this way as the very embodiment of, of, um, of their chosen field. So Artemisia Gentileschi is an artist who gained access to training because it was the family business. Her father was an artist and he had a whole school of apprentices that he worked with. Now his work is on the left here and her work is on the right. And I and it's this is the same subject matter. So it's interesting to, to think about how, how they, um, are similar and different. I should mention that Artemisia Gentileschi painted this image of Susanna and the elders when she was just a teenager. So generally speaking, her father's work is described as being idealized and her work is, is described as being naturalistic. Now in this particular comparison, we are looking at the subject of Susanna and the elders, which is a biblical story that artists have often used um, because it, it, it gives the artist an opportunity to paint a female nude. And, and the story, just a quick encapsulation, is of a woman named Susanna who was uh, caught bathing by these older lecherous men who are essentially uh, in this moment trying to blackmail her in order to um, essentially have relations with her. So in her father's depiction, uh, Susanna is rolling her eyes. Uh, it's just, it's an annoyance. She is being grabbed. She's stopping the assault in progress, but um, but you don't get a, a, a real sense of danger here. They almost look like they're just having a philosophical debate. In, in Artemisia Gentileschi's painting, Susanna twists away and she has a very pained expression on her face. And I'm sure that as a young woman, Artemisia Gentileschi had herself experienced what it was like to have sort of unwanted male attention from older men. So she captures something here that's really powerful. And Artemisia Gentileschi continues on as an artist who, um, who is really good at seeking out female heroes, heroines for us for in order to celebrate in her work. And in this case, we're looking at another biblical subject. We have Judith and Holofernes. This is from about 1620. And in this case, we see another really kind of, well, well we see a powerful woman, um, not just somebody who's twisting away in, um, in, uh, in an attempt to uh, escape unwanted advances. In this case, we know that Judith was a woman who seduced an Assyrian general who was holding her town hostage. And after he fell asleep, she, um, she cuts off his head. So Judith is here with her maidservant and uh, Artemisia Gentileschi is giving us an image that at first glance looks um, violent and wild and chaotic. But if we spend a little bit more time with it, we can see that it is very methodically planned out. Um, Judith's arms here come off at this diagonal 
diagonal, which is balanced by Holofernes' legs going off at a diagonal in the other direction. There's this uh, push up and down happening right at the center of the picture with his hand going up to the maidservant's throat and her hand pushing down here. So there's this uh, sort of fantastic choreography that's happening in this picture that could sort of otherwise uh, go unnoticed if you don't spend a little bit of time with it. Now the style of painting and even the subject matter were really kind of popular at the time. And, um, and there's no doubt that Artemisia Gentileschi kind of based her work or was inspired by a male artist named uh, Caravaggio who had painted painted the same subject uh, just a few years earlier. But you can see that when, uh, when a male artist takes up the subject, uh, the emphasis here is to make Judith sort of young and slender and, and you know, participating in this act in almost, you know, a hands-off approach to a beheading. Whereas um, Artemisia Gentileschi puts Judith right in the heart of the action here. She's very strong and very tough. And just to show you that she was um, really interested in showing us uh, women who uh, were strong, women of consequence. Here's another biblical scene that she shows us of, uh, of, a, of a woman who is about to uh, slay a, another man here, in this case with a, a tent pole. This is... Um, a painting called Jail and Cicera from 1620. So for Artemisia Gentileschi's willingness to show us really tough subject matter, but with uh, women sort of in control and, um, and uh, women as heroines, that definitely qualifies her as our first fierce female. The next woman, woman we're going to look at was considered the most popular, the most well-known French art, French, French female artist of the 19th century, a woman named Rosa Bonheur. And almost everything you need to know about her is right here in this portrait by an artist named Dubuffet. Rosa Bonheur was an artist who specialized in painting animals. So it would make sense that she's just standing here with her arm around a bull. And we can see her with her um, artist portfolio and um, a, a pencil in her hand. So Rosa Bonheur, like uh, Artemisia Gentileschi, came from a family of artists. And in her case, it was a family of artists that specialized in the depiction of animals. So Rosa and her family were creating images that looked like this, you know, people's beloved pets, um, a reliable horse, that sort of thing. And they were done, again, sort of naturalistically. They had um, a sense of um, sentimentality to them. But Rosa Bonner goes one step beyond this. And she created this uh, incredible monumental painting from 1855. This is also in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's called the Horse Fair. So this was a horse market that took place every week in Paris. And so she went for an entire year and sort of stood out of the way and uh, carefully sketched what she saw going on. And when I say that this is a monumental work, it really is. It's roughly 16 feet long and about um, eight feet high. So you can imagine this is like a big physical act just to create this picture. And, and that alone sort of separates her out from so many female artists before her who generally are painting on a small scale and, and generally aren't painting real action sequences like what we see here. And this is all action. And it sort of starts over here on the left and she's created this composition that um, sort of expertly moves our eye across this big panorama here. So Rosa Bonheur uh, was, uh, actually got special dispensation from the French government in order to wear pants to go and, and sketch uh, um, events like this or to go to abattoirs and, and sketch what she saw there, go to uh, uh, veterinary hospitals in order to get more familiar with animals. And she could do this more easily, obviously, by wearing pants. The other piece of this was that she was also openly gay. She loved animals and, um, and she, uh, she made this really her life. She was tough. We can see that she was smoking a cigarette over here. And, um, 
and she was sort of unabashedly like she was who she was. We see her over here on the right with one of her longtime partners, and Rosa Bonheur is wearing this uh, grand cross at her at her throat. This is uh, the first she was the first woman to receive this honor from the French Legion of Honor, and um, and just one last quote from Rosa Bonheur that I've always loved. It said uh, she once said to a male friend, "If you only knew how little I care for your sex, you wouldn't." get such queer ideas in your head. The fact is in the way of males, I only like the bowls I paint. So for being herself, for, um, for crossing the lines in terms of what was appropriate for a female artist to do, or for even how a woman should live, I, I would say all of these things categorize uh, Rosa Bonner as being particularly fierce. So our next artist is Mary Cassatt, and I've gotten into a fair number of debates with people as to whether or not Mary Cassatt was a fierce female. She's our first American artist, but she spent most of her uh, career in France. And so generally speaking, she's, she's sort of lumped in with the French Impressionists. And of the French Impressionists, there were three main female artists. There was Mary Cassatt on the left, Marie Brockmond in the middle, and then Berthe Marisseau on the right. And the next slide I'm going to show you in each of those places are, um, are examples of the kinds of works that these women made. So we can see right off the bat, they tend to be uh, subjects of you know, mothers with their children, um, women who are, are, are reading or um, in many ways just appearing a, a, as, as, as a beautiful subject, but women who aren't actually actively doing things. So this is, these are beautiful paintings and uh, without doubt, but the, this is very different from what men were painting at the same time. And Mary Cassatt in particular was friends with the artist Edgar Degas. In fact, there's art historians that allege that they were more than friends, but I think Mary Cassatt could do better. But Edgar Degas was another French impressionist artist who um, because he was male was able to live a very different life than Mary Cassatt. In fact, he spent a lot of time out in Paris um, at night and his paintings show us kind of the seedy underbelly of the city. He shows us cafe concerts where you have these women who are sort of uh, uh, um, giving, giving these kind of saucy performances. He shows us cafe terraces where prostitutes have gathered. And in comparison, you have Mary Cassatt, who was a woman of good standing from a good family. So for the most part, her paintings look like the ones that you see here. They're depictions of mothers with their children. They're beautiful paintings, but dare I say, the women look a little bored. And then in other paintings, particularly in uh, a series that she did of women having tea, I think that, um, that she is kind of showing us how these women's lives are really constrained. You get this sense of a real restraint in their behaviors and in their appearances here. Now there is one small blip that in Mary Cassatt's career that is very different from this. And this is the blip that makes um, Mary Cassatt fierce, I would argue. And it all has to do with the Paris Opera. So if you've never been to the Paris Opera, this is an interior view over here on the right from the stage. So as you're looking out, it's, it's like a horseshoe shaped venue with um, multiple stories of balconies and of course the floor seating here. And um, and later on, Marc Chagall painted the, the ceiling with this amazing mural. If you've never been to the Paris Opera, put it on your bucket list now. So, um, so the image on the left is a painting by Mary Cassatt. It's a painting of her sister, Lydia, and it's simply called... Um, Woman in a Pearl Necklace from 1879. And what we're most likely looking at here is her sister Lydia in one of these opera boxes, looking out across the way at other people in opera boxes. And she is most likely sitting in front of a mirror. So this would be her reflection here, even though we don't see a pearl necklace on her. So we see Lydia sort of taking in the sights and sounds. Remember what it was like to actually go to the theater and get all dressed up and check everybody else out. That's what Mary Cassatt is showing us here. And so in doing that, she is empowering these women. Instead of, um, 
of, of being simply objects, they uh, are in empowered with what is traditionally known as the male gaze, and um, and and they take on this power, and um, and and essentially what they're looking at becomes the object. So just to give you a really sort of rough sense in terms of how looking at things can be really powerful, just somebody looking at you can change a power dynamic. It's a funny thing to think about, but in the history of art, the fact that women have traditionally been the subject of paintings creates a power dynamic or reinforces a power dynamic that exists. But the simplest um, example I can share with you of, of how looking at something can, um, can be an act of power or can take away somebody's power. Remember um, being in school and dropping your cafeteria tray and it clamors to the ground and everybody looks at you? That is a moment where you feel powerless, you feel naked, and everybody looking has the power. So essentially, these women looking through their tiny opera binoculars have the same sense of power. They're doing the looking, and you get the sense that they're really enjoying it. I've always um, particularly loved this image on the right, which is called... Um, at the opera from 1878. We're so lucky because it's in New England. It's at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And so we see this woman in a black dress. She looks uh, very serious, like a respectable person. There's nothing frivolous about her, but she is most certainly looking across the way at other people and not at the show. Um, because she's multiple stories up and her and her glasses are trained even upwards a little bit. And if you follow the, this uh, balustrade where her elbow is resting, it takes us all the way back to another man who, or another figure, a man in this case, who is looking at her. So it's really, um, uh, you have Mary Cassatt here emphasizing that, that these pictures are about the exchange of glances. Now, a male artist who took up the same subject, and in this case, it's Renoir from just a few years before Mary Cassatt, shows us a woman at the opera who is adorned and beautiful. I mean, she looks like a China doll. She's got gold and pearls and, and um, you know, a silk dress and flowers in her hair and on her dress. And she's holding the binoculars, but she's not really engaged in this kind of careful looking. And meanwhile, we know, we can see her date it just behind her with his glasses pointed up. He's not watching the show, he's checking other people out. So we can see that he has this power in this picture and she does not. Mary Cassatt gives us women who are empowered. And for that reason, I would say she definitely qualifies as a fierce female. The next woman we're going to look at is, um, is a woman of the 20th century. So we're moving quickly now. And we have Georgia O'Keeffe, who's essentially a household name. So this is sort of a shorter section. And Georgia O'Keeffe, as, um, as a young woman, as an art teacher in Texas, was really interested in, um, in florals and in modernism. These are two works that were are, um, the kinds of works that she sent off to New York to a, a man named um, Stieglitz who ran a really influential gallery. And she showed uh, him this, this interest that she had and he sort of mentors her and helps her to develop kind of a, a perspective in her work. He also marries her. So shortly after they're, they're married, she takes these interests and she melds them into these monumental works, these flower paintings that we're all really familiar with because they've been on um, postcards and, and calendars for, for decades decades now. But even though they're familiar, they're ubiquitous, these are the kinds of paintings that can still make a room full of adults blush and giggle, because we've all heard the stories about what these pictures are really about. And I should mention that this is her painting called Red Kana from 1924. So the, the thinking here is that this is uh, some sort of reference or um, representation of, of female anatomy. And, um, and I would say, let's set that aside for just a moment and talk about how revolutionary this is in terms of a depiction of a flower. Uh, women in particular have been uh, painting floral still lifes 
for centuries. This is a picture that goes back to the 1700s. And there's been a pretty obvious formula that goes along with painting a floral still life for all this time. Uh, most artists tried to incorporate as much color as they could, incorporate a variety of blossoms from um, buds to, to uh, decaying blooms. Uh, and then going back to the Dutch Baroque, they always love to include a lot of bugs and, and moths and that sort of thing. And of course, what Georgia O'Keeffe is giving us here is uh, she's creating one blossom and she's making it monumental and she makes us feel like we are inside of it. It almost has like stage lighting inside of it too. She's revealing every petal and every fold. Here's a, another example of her work. This one is called Gray Line with Black, Blue and Yellow from 1923. So believe it or not, it was actually her husband, this uh, sort of renowned uh, promoter of American modernism, who promoted the idea that these were images of female, the female anatomy. And of course, that, that notion has stuck around for decades. And it, it's a theory that Georgia O'Keeffe herself never really sanctioned. She never really said, no, that's what's going on here. So by the 1970s, when you have a generation, a new generation, of feminist art historians, they're going back and they're looking at sort of how to understand these kinds of images. This is my favorite of, of Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings. I just love this kind of inky blue black in it. This is Jack in the Pulpit 4 from 1930. So essentially the way feminist art historians read these pictures now, knowing that it was her husband who promoted the idea that it's female anatomy, um, they read them as expressions of female empowerment. And because uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, like you know, so many of the fierce females we've already seen, was defying expectations with these works, I would say that she certainly qualifies as a fierce female. The next artist I wanted to share with you is one who is probably not a household name. She is Lee Miller, was Lee Miller. She was a female war correspondent who covered the US Army um, in the European theater during World War II. And so we see uh, a photograph of her here and you can see very clearly labeled war correspondent. So she has this kind of incredible life story. She was this uh, really sort of strikingly beautiful young woman who came from Poughkeepsie, New York, moved to New York City at a very young age and almost accidentally stepped out into traffic and was pulled back onto the sidewalk by none other than Condé Nast. And then within a month, I think she was modeling for Vogue. And as a model, she began to connect with and, um, and spend a lot of time with um, leading photographers. And, and as an individual, she, uh, she really gravitated towards creative voices and creative perspectives, and she could create these little artistic creative communities around her. She ended up moving to France to study specifically with the artist Man Ray. And there were a lot of artists at the time who were creating these modernist photographs of abstracted female bodies like this. But Lee Miller's photograph uh, um, on the left, I think sort of stands out because it doesn't, it's not overtly sexual, sexualized. It's not even really sensual. It's just, um, it's surprising. It's a surprising uh, pose and it takes, and it's sort of disorienting. You have to kind of take some time to even understand what you're looking at. Man Ray actually used Lee Miller as a subject in his work, um, which is called the um, indestructible object. And so this is a photograph of Lee Miller's eye over here with the metronome. So the war breaks out, Lee Miller is in London and she decides to stay. She travels all over Europe to document what's happening with the war. Um, on the left, we have a photograph from 1944. This is an exhausted nurse in Normandy, France, uh, just after the, uh, about a month after D-Day. And she had been there working as a part of a team that uh, addressed all of the uh, wounded from that battle. And you can, get a real sense of the strength and also the exhaustion of, of somebody in that role. 
On the right, we have children celebrating after the liberation of France. This is such like a, a joyful, jubilant scene at, um, that, and you just love all, the, the, all of these kids in the picture that it sort of takes a moment before you see that um, this car is, you know, doesn't have any tires. It's up on the sidewalk. There are sandbags behind the kids. And then we get a, a sense of the real relief that they must be feeling that the war is over. Um, Lee Miller did not shy away from tough images. We have um, a bombed out church on the right. We have a dead SS officer floating in the canal on the left. And Lee Miller and her partner um, actually got a special permission to go to two of the concentration camps in Germany to photograph and document what they saw there. This was in 1945. And these images are just so striking and heartbreaking and difficult to look at, but um, it gives you a very good sense in terms of the horrific conditions that existed there at that time. And I can only imagine what these men were thinking as Lee Miller was walking through their bunk in this instance. So shortly after she took these photographs, she actually went to Munich and, um, and she and her partner, uh, a man by the name of David Sherman, who worked for Life magazine, they went into um, Hitler's apartment and they took this kind of iconic photograph. In this case, Lee Miller is the subject, but I would say the uh, co-creator, certainly. So she, here she is taking a bath in Hitler's bathtub and they've staged this photo because they've included a photo of Hitler next to his tub. I'm sure he didn't have that in real life. Um, they probably brought in the sculpture of a female nude, but you even have Lee Miller's uh, boots, which probably have the dirt from the concentration camp still on them. And, um, and then you have that hose from the tub that sort of uh, loops down behind her, which can almost uh, seem like a reference to a noose or something like that. So it's a really striking image, but I would say for her bravery, um, for her willingness to stay in Europe and document what she saw during a, a really horrific war, uh, those, those aspects of her life would certainly make her a fierce female artist. Now, our next artist is from right around the same time period and was living a, a very different life. She was a Mexican woman uh, named Frida Kahlo and she, her name has sort of become a household name in recent years too. And she's famous for um, uh, uh, se the severe injuries she suffered in a trolley bus accident when she was 18. And for the fact that she had to spend so much of her life uh, in bed recovering for, from uh, about two dozen surgeries that she had to endure over the course of, of, of the following decades because of this particular uh, bus accident. She was 18 years old at the time and the accident broke her collarbone, it dislocated her shoulders, broke multiple ribs, broke her spine in multiple places, her pelvis in multiple places, broke her leg in 11 places and essentially crushed one of her feet. She was also impaled by a bus railing that went through her pelvis and uterus. It's hard to imagine that a, that a person could survive such a thing. So it gives you a sense in terms of the pain that she suffered. And so her paintings sort of flesh that out for us. And they have been compared to works by Van Gogh in terms of um, the emotional honesty uh, it, of, of these works. So this is her painting called Broken Column from 1944. And here she is showing us her body, which is ripped open in the same way that this kind of cracked and barren landscape is ripped open in the back. Her spine has been replaced by um, this fluted column, which has cracks all up and down it. She's being held together by this uh, corset that looks like it's fabric, but it's there's actually um, metal underneath it. So I think just the just wearing the corset was very painful. And of course, she's showing herself with these pins and nails sticking out of her skin all over her body. And even though her face is not twisted in anguish, we can see that there are tears spilling down her face. I, you can't really talk about Frida Kahlo without mentioning the eyebrows here. So she is an artist who's very famous for depicting herself with a faint mustache and with really po prominent eyebrows uh, or a unibrow. And that was something that she sort of cultivated throughout her life. It was um, another way to sort of defy expectations and, and get a lot of attention in, in the process. So 
here's another painting that she created about her experience with surgeries. This is called The Tree of Hope Remains Strong from 1946. This was when she had just um, gone under the knife for a, a surgery that she was uh, very hopeful about, a major surgery on her back. And so she shows us herself in two different lights, literally night and day. And uh, one version of herself is the patient who's sort of faceless here on the hospital gurney. And her body has been sort of torn open again, like the landscape be behind her. And then Frida Kahlo shows us herself in a traditional Mexican dress. This was um, clothing that she often adopted to uh, really kind of celebrate her Mexican heritage. And it was, uh, it was an iconic look that again, sort of got her a lot of attention. So she's holding the sign that says the tree of hope remain firm. And she's also holding the back brace that at that time she had been wearing quite a bit. So we see a, a sense of hopefulness uh, despite uh, the, the pain of this particular surgery. The surgery itself was not successful and she created this, um, this painting in response to it. This is called Wounded Deer from the same year. And so we can see that she has put her own face on the, uh, as the head of, of this deer that has been pierced by all of these different arrows here. A deer that's been um, shot this many times you would not expect to live. Interestingly, she's given herself antlers. So in this case, she's a male deer and Frida Kahlo was a, a woman who would sometimes dress in men's clothing and she was also bisexual. So perhaps she's kind of um, trying to channel uh, that, that aspect of her personality in this particular image. She's in a forest in this case, but the forest is, is not green and growing. It's sort of um, also kind of dry and cracked and barren. And um, according to some art historians, that I've read, this broken branch in the foreground is part of a, a Mexican tradition where you would put a broken branch on someone's grave. So, um, so she's showing herself as vulnerable here. She's uh, referencing her, her own pain and mortality in a really kind of striking and sort of disturbing way. Interestingly, she gave this picture to her friends as a wedding present. It's hard to imagine living with a painting like this uh, in your everyday life. And the last Frida Kahlo image that I wanted to share with you is this one here that's called The Dream of the Bed from 1940. Frida Kahlo, as I mentioned, spent a lot of time in bed recovering from these surgeries. And so we see her here sort of sleeping peacefully and there are these green gr vines that are growing all around her. And that green, so to me, sort of references um, um, healing, vitality, and, and, and growth in, in general. And this bed is kind of floating in this dreamscape up in the sky, in the clouds. And Frida is kind of um, facing us, her head resting on two pillows. Just above on the canopy here is a skeleton in the same pose facing us, his head on two pillows, holding a bouquet of flowers, but his body is wired with dynamite. And it seems to be this reference to this idea that death could happen in an instant and that um, it's the sort of very nature of death itself. And, and so even when you feel the sense of peace and, and restoration, anything could happen. Um, so, so I think for uh, her, her physical strength and resilience and her willingness to share um, all of her experiences with us as her viewers, I would, I would say these, these aspects of, of Frida Kahlo's life and work certainly categorize her as a fierce female. One of the last artists I wanted to share with you is Elizabeth Catlett, and she's um, of African-American descent and also Mexican descent. And she is an artist who is primarily a printmaker, also a sculptor, and she was very wedded to creating works that told the story of African-American history. And she wanted to, to do that using the uh, realistic style so that the, the works themselves could speak to um, and be understood by as many people as possible. And because it's the printmaking idiom here, we also have the notion that these works can be reproduced. Now, to put this in the simplest terms possible, to create a print like this, you um, imagine if you're sitting at a table or a surface and you just sort of carved out 
um, the image of a smiley face and then poured some ink into the space where you've carved. When you apply a sheet of paper to that ink and you hold up the sheet of paper, this the ink will have transferred and the smiley face will be on the paper even though you did the carving into, into your table. So, um, so when you look at something like this, you can tell that she is expert at this particular medium um, because we have um, the, the real crispness, crispness of all of these lines. And in, in this case in particular, we're looking at an image that's called Sharecropper from 1952. So just the title alone um, indicates that this is a person who is economically oppressed. But uh, Elizabeth Catlett shows us uh, this person from uh, a perspective where we are sort of down below her and, and it sort of exalts the subject in this case. We, we see her as a very strong, sort of beautiful, capable person despite the circumstances that she is in. So this is from 1952. A number of works that, uh, that Catlett created also deal with African-American history. And this is such an important thing to note because in terms of the history of art, it, the history of American art, there isn't a great deal representing African-American history. And it was really left to African-American artists to create uh, these, or to memorialize the, these important narratives. So in this case, we're looking at Harriet Tubman from 1975. Harriet Tubman is this um, much larger figure in the scene. We've got sort of a hierarchy of scale here. She's pointing forward. She's the leader. Um, we see sort of the, the strength of, of her physical being. She's also carrying a gun. You don't often see women carrying guns in the history of American art. And she is leading these other figures from slavery to freedom. It's a really very powerful work of art that, um, that tells the story of the Underground Railroad and of Harriet Tubman's bravery in particular. Elizabeth Catlett shows a number of images or created a number of images that deal with um, just how dangerous it was to be African-American um, in America in the 1950s and 60s. Here we see a man with a rope tied around his neck who looks like he has been lynched and perhaps cut down uh, as there are figures uh, whose feet are sort of hanging down from the top of this composition um, and standing on that rope. Here we have a young boy who's being menaced uh, by this sort of skeletal looking Klu, Klu Klux Klan member um, with another member in the background um, and a burning cross, another noose included in this picture. So she wasn't afraid to tackle stuff, uh, tough subjects that would have probably um, uh, 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 made her the subject of criticism at the same time for, for depicting the, these issues. As I mentioned, she was also a sculptor and I particularly love this example of her work because the, the woman that she's created in this sculpture from 1973 looks like somebody that you would see, you know, studying at Starbucks or something like that. But in this case, it's a historical figure named Phyllis Wheatley. And Phyllis Wheatley was a, a woman who came to the United States as a slave and, um, and was incredibly intelligent and published a book of poetry uh, at a very young age, uh, mastered a number of languages, met George Washington. She was just this incredible success story um, from the 1700s. And so she took the frontispiece of Phyllis Wheatley's poetry book and she translated that into uh, a more modern or maybe even timeless uh, depiction of a very thoughtful, pensive African-American woman. So um, Elizabeth Catlett's ability and, and bravery in terms of depicting African-American subjects and, um, and showing them as, as heroes, I think at the time that she was working too, categorizes her as a fierce female. Now, the very last artist that we're going to look at today, and I know we're just flying through all this, is Maya Lin. And she's the only artist that we're looking at who is um, still alive today. And she is uh, a Chinese American architectural designer. And we're seeing her here with a plan for her most famous work, which was um, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So if you look very carefully, you can probably see there's like this um, 
black V on this plan here. And that is the, the memorial that probably most of us have experienced firsthand. She was just 21 years old when her design was selected in a blind competition. Blind meaning that um, the names of, of the designers were not attached to the, to the designs themselves. And it was pretty controversial that an Asian American's work was, was selected for a war that took place um, in Vietnam. Uh, Ross Perot, the former presidential candidate actually called Maya Lin an egg roll when it was revealed that, that she, that she won and that she was Chinese American. Uh, the, this design in particular received a lot of criticism when it was unveiled and, um, and when it was first built. But today, um, and in recent years, it has been ranked among the most favorite designs, architectural designs in the US by the American Institute of Architects. So let's take a look at it and what makes it so special. Um, the Vietnam Veterans Wall, uh, Memorial is made up of these long, black, highly polished granite walls. And some of them stand um, as tall as 10 feet high, and then they get smaller and smaller as they, um, as they extend out from the center. Uh, the, uh, there's about 246 of these panels, and the panels contain the names of about 58,000 uh, Americans who died during this war. So I can't emphasize enough how different this is in terms of memorializing um, a war than anything that had come before it for America. I mean, we are so used to marble. We're so used to celebration. We're so used to just saying heroes, heroes, heroes. And what Maya Lin gives us is essentially um, a wound that's been carved into the ground. It's, um, it's like the monumental monument equivalent of a funeral. And so the fact that it's a dark stone, the, the, the fact that um, there's no figurative elements here uh, really makes this as a, a, um, a, a place to reflect and a place to connect because when you're there, you can see your own reflection in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this memorial. And you can find the names of people that you knew, people that you're related to, people that you lost, and you can even take a rubbing and take it home. Um, when's the last time you did something like that with, uh, with any other war memorial or, or memorial in general? Um, so it's a very personal experience. And, um, and I think it inspires this kind of quiet reverence in a way that so many other uh, monuments and memorials do not. So just very quickly, I wanted to show you one last uh, memorial that she created. And this is down in Montgomery, Alabama at the Southern Poverty Law Center. She created this in 1989. So again, this highly polished black granite and the quote from Martha, Martin Luther King that references uh, you know, the, the waters uh, uh, and justice rolling down. So you have this water feature coming down over the wall here. And then you have this um, sort of like a round table and there's water kind of spilling out over this round table, which also functions as a timeline of the civil rights movement. And this is just so brilliant to me. So you can go through this timeline and you can literally touch these important moments that have touched your life or touched the lives of your family or touched all of our lives essentially. And, um, and you don't just touch it, you sort of, you take the water back with you. It's, um, it, it's a connection that extends past just that simple touch. It's really striking, it's really moving. Um, and, and it's uh, again, sort of a revolutionary approach to, um, to monument design in general. So in 2009, Maya Lin received the National Medal of Arts from Barack Obama in a ceremony pictured here. She's still alive and I'm sure there are still great things in store from her. So we will wrap up by looking ahead, sort of thinking about what's in store for female artists going forward. And I bring back the Gorilla Girls, the conscience of the art world, who remind us you're seeing less than half of the picture without the vision of women artists and artists of color. And I feel like more and more today, these days, we have, um, we're having national conversations about just that, about um, uh, diversifying 
uh, as, uh, as much as possible and getting as many voices in as much as possible. So we have another Guerrilla Girls uh, uh, image here, a poster in this case to um, promote an event. And the text says, being angry is a great place to start. And so it's a reminder that, that nothing really changes for the, the status of women or, or anybody else who's been marginalized unless there are people who are willing to kind of take up the fight. So we'll wrap up by just sort of reflecting on what has changed, what hasn't. Uh, recently, the New York Times reported that female artists made little progress in museums since 2008, which is sort of heartbreaking. It's sort of like the more things change, the more they stay the same. But we do have glimmers of hope and um, places like the Baltimore Museum of Art uh, made the decision to exclusively collect works by women for an entire year. And I feel like the more we get women seated at the table where power exists, the more we'll see decisions like that um, happening. And, and um, so I'm hopeful in, in that sense. And I think that's probably a good place for us to stop for today. And I welcome any questions anybody might have on the material we covered. I'll also take a look at our chat here. Jane, it's Holly. Thank you very much. That was fantastic presentation. And while you're scrolling through those chat messages, um, which several of them are um, singing your praises. <laughs> so, and of course, we, we all um, are just, I'm just amazed by all the information that you were able to share um, in today's program. Um, there were a couple of, you, you'll probably see them. There were a couple that were um, very specific uh, questions. Yes, so one of them was about Frida Kahlo and the lightning in the background. Um, thank you for bringing that up. In fact, I've shared this program with, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people, and you were the first person to ask about that. And I'm not sure if there is um, one concrete way of understanding it, but I would say that for almost anything that Frida Kahlo painted, there was a, a way to understand it through the experience of th that she had with her own body. So when I see lightning, I'm thinking of, of um, quick and jolting pain within her body and perhaps something like that. Or perhaps it's just referencing a storm in general and the storm is, you know, the depression that she's feeling because of the, the, the particular hopelessness she had around this surgery. So I, I appreciate that you brought it up and I'm sorry I don't have like a hard and fast reading on it, but I would, I would say that connecting it directly to her physical being is probably a safe assumption in that case. Um, I'm seeing that Lawrence asked about the CRC. So I'm going to go up to Elizabeth Catlett here. And the CRC was the Civil Rights Congress, which took place um, in 1950. So it was, a, 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 I imagine, um, an attempt to expand civil rights. We have an African-American man who's like, uh, uh, has the sash across him that has CRC on it. Um, but perhaps uh, this is Elizabeth Catlett being critical of him or, um, or showing how the CRC was sort of restraining um, the Ku Klux Klan or, or other um, abuses of, of civil rights. So, um, so I, actually, as I'm just talking right now, I think that this is a celebratory image of, of the, the Civil Rights Congress. Thank you for asking about that. And thank you for the kind words as I'm go going through the, the text. And my friend Jim is here. Jim, thank you for your kind words too. Uh, somebody said, would you include Dorothea Lang in the group of fierce artists? And, you know, I probably would. I would say I'm most familiar with Dorothea Lang and, um, and the migrant mother. I don't know much um, about her beyond that, but that is such a powerful series. And, um, and I think it would be really interesting to, to sort of go back and see, you know, if there were aspects of her life or other aspects of her work, which sort of um, fall into this category of kind of defying expectations for her gender or what was considered appropriate for the time. I'm sure there probably weren't a ton of other female photographers who were out documenting poverty at that time. So, you know, off the top of my head, I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Billy Holiday. Oh, Jim, I'm gonna have to watch um, the U.S. versus Billy Holiday. I've, I've seen, I've heard good things. All right. Well, I know that was a lot of content. There's a lot to sort of ruminate on there. And, um, and so if there's anything else that comes up, if you have any additional questions, feel free to um, reach out to me from my web, through my website, which is IamCulturallyCurious.com. Um, and you can also find uh, other presentations that I give throughout the month. Um, there's a lot of organizations that are interested in, in showing works by, by female artists. So this is a popular subject, but I also have a program. It's my featured program for the month that's just on Frida Kahlo. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about her, you can go to my website and see when the next Frida program is. Excellent, Jane. That was wonderful. Um, good to know. And um, folks, I do encourage you to visit Jane's website. Um, there's a lot of there's just a lot of good things on there just to begin with, but you'll be able to see that schedule and uh, look for more programming. Um, well, I thank you all for visiting with us this afternoon. I know you have busy days, busy lives, and uh, I'm glad that you took some time to um, join us for the library's um, program. And I hope that you check out our calendar of events page on the website so that you can see what else is coming up this month. There are all kinds of things happening every week. So we hope to see you again. Don't be strangers. And um, I hear warmer weather is coming for those of us that are actually here in New England. Um, I think it's gonna get a little bit better later this week. So I'm looking forward to that. And I hope you all stay well and we'll see you all soon. Thank you much. Take care everyone. Thank you. <laughs>